You're listening to Driving Law, a podcast by Kyla Lee about all things related to the rules of the road. Hello, and welcome to another episode of Driving Law. I am Kyla Lee. I'm Paul Doroshenko. Hi, Paul. Thanks for joining me again. It's my pleasure. I'm glad that we can sort this out, that we can find the time at some yeah. point in the week to sit and yeah. talk. Yeah. Well, um, I had hoped not to have you this week. Oh, thanks. Yeah. I, I reached out to the author of a new study from UBC that we're going to talk about, hoping that he would come and talk about the study on the podcast, but um, he didn't respond to my emails. So far, no response. So I got like the brush off. Not necessarily. You didn't get the brush off. I got, he got ghosted me. He, he never even, if he'd never talked to you before, he hasn't ghosted you. Well, why hasn't he talked to me? Why didn't he He might he be respond? out of town. He might be camping. He might be, no I mean, come on, give the person, reply. give him the benefit of the doubt. Give him the benefit of the doubt. Come on. Anyway. So what's the study? Tell this, me about it. I, I saw the, I saw the headline about it. I saw that it was tweeted. I didn't read the study. I didn't look at, even read the articles. What's it about? So the study looked at uh, cannabis and crashes and looking at the presence of THC in drivers' blood systems after motor vehicle collisions. How do they get the blood? Uh, well, I'll explain all of that to you. Well. But I thought it would be important just to, to preface this by reminding you that about Two or three weeks ago, Andrew Murray, the CEO of Mad Canada, gave an interview to the media in which he said that uh, the presence of THC in the bloodstream was the leading cause of death on Canadian roadways. Yeah, that was just absurd. And I mean, I'm, most people just laughed at it, but it totally damages the credibility of Mad if they come out and make stupid statements like that. Well, I That's know. ridiculous. It, it was absolutely stupid. But now we have good cold hard data that shows that Andrew Murray was actually stupid. So I'm going to read you from um, uh, from the measurements section of the study so you can understand what they were looking for here. Um, so essentially what they were doing was after they took clinical blood samples, so people who were taken to the hospital following a collision, who had blood taken for medical purposes, the remaining blood that was left that they'd collected and had not analyzed or used um, was um, given a broad spectrum toxicology test. So they looked for basically anything that could be there, including alcohol, cannabis, um, uh, other impairing drugs, um, and sedating medications. Now, obviously, the sedating medications is going to be an issue because some of people may have been given those in the context of the... Um, treatment that they were receiving. Yeah, yeah, sure enough. But that's what they were looking for. But they would know what, what the people were likely given. Yes. So they could eliminate that. Yes. And uh, they also took the crash reports from the police, so the motor vehicle 6020 forms, mm -hmm. to determine whether or not the driver was responsible for the collision or whether or not they were like an innocent victim of a collision, like, you know, sitting at a red light and T-boned by a crazy person. Yeah, they might need more information than that to be able to make that determination of liability, but a lot of times it's clear on the face of that accident report. Yeah. Um, and so they used that information, uh, something called unconditional logistic regression, and I don't know what that means, but statistically I'm sure it means something. I'm sure it does. Sounds important. Yeah. Sounds very important. Um, to determine the likelihood, referred to as the odds ratio, of crash responsibility in drivers with THC concentrations between 0 and 2 nanograms per milliliter and from 2 to 5 and from 5 and up. So looking at the permissible THC concentration for class 5 drivers, the summary conviction threshold for drivers with THC in their system and the hybrid offense threshold it's good that they broke it down that way because I know. they broke it down applying the um, the law. The law. Yeah, it was useful, and they also adjusted their risk risk estimates using age, sex, and the presence of other impairing substances. So if you had more than one thing on board, um, then they would you know you would have an increased ri risk estimate adjusted as yeah. a result of that. If there's if alcohol old, <laughs> on board, it kind of screws it up. If you're really old or really young, um, male more likely to be in an accident than female. 
statistically speaking, this no, is true. No, of course. I yes. Know. So I'm, I'm rolling my eyes, but I know it's true. I yeah. was also a young male. Yeah, exactly. Um, so they ended up analyzing the blood samples from 3,005 drivers. That's who a were, lot. That's yeah. a good sample size. Holy. Yeah. Um, 3,005, and they ended up, of those 3,005, successfully obtaining police reports in 2,318 cases. Also a large yeah. sample size. 14.4% of the people who were in the sampling had alcohol in their systems. It's not as much as I would have expected. I know. I, I would, would have thought, thought it was higher. Like yeah. 30. Yeah. Um, THC in 83 so actually not that much difference between THC and alcohol. Yeah, I'm like, surprised. You know, some six, THC, though. Six percentage. We're not talking. We yeah, some THC. Down. Pre- we're talking presence at this point. And other drugs in 8.9. So in fact, people were more likely to have other drugs than THC in their systems if they were injured in a collision. But necessarily impairing drugs and to necessarily impairing amounts, it doesn't probably doesn't deal with that because it's focused on THC here. Well, no, they were, they did the broad spectrum toxicology. So they were looking for other impairing drugs okay. and they were focused on impairing drugs. So, okay. you know, they're not looking for okay. people who have Tylenol. And they found uh, that there was also 19.8% of drivers. So that's the highest of all of them had sedating medications, AKA opioids, barbiturates. Interesting. Yeah. So that's your biggest percentage of people who are responsible for and injured in collisions could just also be people who took some nyquil yep the night before yeah well nyquil is like i believe trace amounts of opiates i have no idea i i don't want to i don't want to defame nyquil i don't know what they've got in it (laughs) i think at one point maybe like it has codeine i don't know what's in it i have no idea what's in it all i know is you can buy it over the counter and i also know that people who use sleep medication tend to have heart attacks earlier and it they don't know if it's because they lack sleep and are stressed or if it's something to do with the sleep medication. Interesting. Well, okay, so they found that drivers with less than 2 nanograms per milliliter of THC in their blood and drivers with less than 5 So basically anybody under five nanograms per milliliter had no increased risk of crash responsibility, like none whatsoever. That is fascinating. Yeah. Because remember when we did the Drager tests, I, um, along with many others, uh, used cannabis and Mm -hmm. um, the, uh, I got a positive reading on the Drager at one point. Then I got a negative reading on it a little bit later on and I, still certainly felt impaired at that point yes. and we did uh we did a urine test of me and i think i came clean and remember that um though the, the dragger's threshold was 25 nanograms per milliliter no i know i'm just saying like i, I also passed a, a drug recognition evaluation yeah. and i personally felt that i was impaired despite the fact that i passed the drug recognition evaluation I without did, any difficulty i did better on the drug recognition evaluation after smoking half a joint than I did when I did it the first time. Well, um, yeah, so... When I was sober. But the other interesting thing that we found was that the people who were regular users had much higher THC levels. So this seems to go against that. I mean, they were regular users, had high THC levels when they were tested, but had no symptoms of impairment. Yeah. But this seems to go against that. That seems to be suggesting high THC level connected to impairment. In fact... And this is the part or that I, actually, or am I you're getting ahead, ahead of me. You're okay. getting ahead of me. But okay. um, I mean, this study has been really widely reported in the media, as you've seen. Yeah. And rightly so. It's fascinating. Um, but what uh, what got me is that the media has not been focusing on the most important part of the study, which you're about to which is. spoil, which is in drivers with THC concentrations greater than five nanograms per milliliter. The adjusted odds ratio, likelihood of being in an at-fault crash, was 1.74. And that is considered a statistically non-significant increased risk risk of crash responsibility. So that's 
That's essentially... You, you can't say that there's any increased risk, really. No, that they they essentially conclude that the when you have like an odds ratio 1.74, it's not a statistically significant increased risk because it's associated with just the general odds ratio of being at fault in a crash anyway. Exactly. So it's not, yeah, yeah. Like that one time I drove through a red light that had been stale that I'd stopped at because my mind just blanked for a second. Oh, exactly. So, I mean, it's, it, it is basically the same as if you weren't, uh, yeah. if you weren't using cannabis, um, yeah. the statistics are, are, are essentially the same. Yes. Which is, which is crazy. Because, well, no, it's not crazy. Well, no, I mean, it's, it's crazy just that, that our legal system is. It's crazy that our legal system is the way that it is, but it's not crazy that this is, you know, what the truth is. I mean, that the no. reality is there's lots of cannabis enthusiasts and, and activists who have held for years that that doesn't have the same impairing effect. We've seen the direction of a lot of the studies. Um, there's been, you know, studies that have been been created by foreign governments where they've looked into it. Nobody's looked into it to the extent that they uh, could make any really good conclusions. But the government has gone the complete opposite direction. They've sort of assumed uh, impairment at relatively low levels and and making it a criminal offense at these relatively low levels. And at any level, it's hard to say that it should be a criminal offense at all. Yep. Impairment. Make impairment a criminal oh, offense. Sure. Fine. And you can detect impairment through physical coordination, cognitive difficulties, and driving behavior, or a combination of any of the above. Sure. Except some people are just weird. Some people are just weird, but, you know, if they're weird and they're charged with impaired, you can call witnesses to explain they're always like that. They're just weird. Yeah, I don't like that. Pluralist Why? society, I don't like the weird to be persecuted. Um, yeah, but the weird are persecuted. There's no doubt. And in a pluralist society, if we wanted to have... I feel persecuted. If we wanted to fully embrace pluralism, we couldn't have a criminal code. We couldn't have offenses that's, that's for... A, that's, a, that's a different discussion. That's child a, predation. We better have a different discussion for that one. Okay. Let's get back to <laughs> driving. And yes. stick with driving and driving law. So basically, in the end, what they've concluded is that the whole system that was designed in the criminal code of coming up with per se limits for impairment for uh, cannabis, which is was the justification of the delay, the huge delay in yeah. legalization. Well, we've got to protect the roadways. Was the, the fear of carnage on the roadways and all they had to do was um, look at statistics that were already existent, mm -hmm. pre-existent statistics and do a good read of those pre-existent that the evidence that would had already been collected and they mm -hmm. would have come to the conclusion that none of this was necessary Not which so. brings me to you know screw you taxpayer what what does this cost taxpayers and what is it going to cost to deal with it when it gets to the court and how many people who are basically who are just innocent with a prohibited THC level are going to end up with criminal convictions i want to ask that question uh, and that's something maybe we should ask, discuss another day. But we are now uh, six months in since the uh, criminal legislation changed on impaired driving well, you know uh, what? in December. And that's a I, good discussion I for think, us to have. I think we need to call the government to task on this. You know, we had, I talked to Scott McDonald, the author of Cannabis Crashes, Myths and Truths, um, which you can buy online. Uh, who talked about the book that he wrote, which was effectively a literature review of everything out there related to cannabis crashes. He was a good interview. He was and a he very good interview. he laid it all out. And yeah. sure enough, and this is, this said, is consistent this. with this. Yeah, this he is said consistent. This. The, yeah. the, the bulk of the scientific research said this, and the ones that were the outliers were interpreting the data wrong. It sure, it, you know, I expect... Ron Moore. I know. My friend Ron who came on the podcast and gave another great interview about cannabis crashes and risk, somebody who studied it extensively and who is a forensic toxicologist and who is a lawyer, um, just like, you know, a, a very smart human being, said this. You know, I, I'm, I'm sorry I'm going to go off track, but when the government takes the position that they do uh, and it's not based on science... And they advocate for a certain position, like they did with the with the um, drug impaired provisions changes to the criminal code. It just destroys the confidence we have in it. And really, in the end, what is it? 
it's fucking fake news. Yeah. The government is promoting like, fake news. I mean, I, and I, here I, we are. I'm we have, loath to use I, that term. I, 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 I'm, you know, I'm going to vote liberal uh, in the federal election uh, because I look at the alternative and, you know, the alternative is so much worse. Well, there's the Greens uh, and the NDP. Well, yeah, but I want to vote for a party that can form the government. But the point here is that, like, the, the here we've got uh, Trudeau saying they're going to pass legislation to try and deal with fake news on the internet and meanwhile they have been out there promoting something um bill blair and jody wilson rabel promoting something that was not a threat to the population they didn't do the research and instead they took the reactionary position in order to facilitate an agenda well i mean where is david lametti and why are people not marching in the streets to go that the entire criminal blood THC concentration scheme that's been enacted by Parliament has been shown in statistical research conducted in British Columbia after legalization to be bogus. And that if, if that's what the government passed as a law and they said, these laws are going to need adjustment and we're going to need, you know, some time to work things out and figure out how it's going to work. This is one thing that they can now say was done wrong and they should repeal it. Well, you know, they're not going to do it before the federal election, obviously, because the federal election is coming in fall Probably and they're not going to admit to to, that they did something wrong. Um, all of the changes that came with respect to impaired driving, uh, you know, a significant portion of them will be challenged and many of them, you know, aspects of it may be struck down. Uh, and I guess we have to wait and see. But the problem Why is that... Why doesn't our AG put a reference question to the court? Well, you know, my view is that somebody's going to have to look at it and do a bit of an unwind here of, uh, of Jody Wilson-Raybould's legislation um, with respect to impaired driving. And, you know, it's, it's either we spend millions of dollars resolving every little issue from that uh, legislation in court, and then we end up with another piecemeal, you know, this was an attempt to make some sort of whole uh, concept of impaired driving legislation instead of having the piecemeal legislation that we had before where some parts fit in certain circumstances and others didn't. Mm -hmm. I think they're going to have to go back and revisit it because otherwise it's going to get torn apart. It's going to get torn apart in litigation. And um, and things like this just generate cynicism. And it, and it also gives... Um, they didn't need to generate cynicism in me. I was well, all they, alone. They also, <laughs> they also hand off all of this... Um, evidence weaponry oh, to to their to their critics like good good luck I'm, I'm supportive but you know you know <laughs> where is the first person being charged under these blood thc concentration rules because that person needs to phone me well i mean or somebody else or john conroy you know, somebody or else who's got Kirk it Tucson, who's on top or, of it or jack lloyd or rob Laurie. there's people across the country who yeah. are on top of it but the point is that the um i mean we're not the only lawyers doing this no kyla just because you've worked it all out in your mind doesn't mean you're going to be the one who necessarily gets that file. No, but I'm just saying. I just gave a list of like a half a dozen names. I know. I would I would be happy for any of them to do it. I know. I hear you. I understand. And in impaired driving lawyers but specifically, my, I could name a bunch of others. I know. I guess my point is that I just, you know, see the courts having to grapple with this and ending up with a mess and, yeah. and I think to myself, why? There's no need. That could have just been, you know, all of this could have been resolved if they just thought about it a little bit more and weren't so zealous in it. And I'm, I'm you know, I'm very disappointed in, in Bill Blair as a result. I, I expected him to have become... I'm not. He's only been in the job for a few months. He's not going to rewrite Long all enough. of the legislation. Long enough to have he, done something. He's not going to rewrite all the legislation. All he's done is appoint passed. judges everywhere but here. Well, he's appointed judges, which is something they didn't do before. So. Everywhere but here. Yeah, I'm sure they'll we appoint some judges. We the, got one. One is better than none. Yeah, I'm, but it was one that I'm, was elevated from Supreme to Appeal, which meant we were left with one less at Supreme. Well, they, you know, there was a huge backlog across the country. We don't have the same Jordan problem in British Columbia as they've got in many other places as a result of the fact that we have the IRP scheme. So delays in the courts are not... Don't as speak bad. Speak well of the IRP scheme. I'm speaking poorly of the IRP scheme in the sense that um, you know it's uh, taken away something that you should have a right to defend in front of a judge. Speaking of things that you should have a right to defend in front of a judge, you have segued nicely into our next topic. Any way I can help, Kyla? Yes. 
which is a recent ruling from the BC Court of Appeal uh, in an immediate roadside prohibition case. That's great. And you're going to have to tell me about it because, as usual, you're the one who prepares for the podcast and I'm the one who has to sit on the hot seat and try and get through it. Yeah, but you usually have an opinion about stuff anyway. I have an opinion about so everything. This case was called Adams. Almost. I don't have an opinion about everything. Some things I don't. Maybe the Adams decision I do. Tell me about it. You will have an opinion about this. So Miss Adams was uh, reported to police. What had happened was a woman made a report uh, to police after seeing Miss Adams pull up uh, park uh, badly in the parking lot of a brewery. Um, she let her passengers out and then struggled to parallel park, ultimately bumping into the vehicle behind her. She gets out, there's some damage, she leaves a note, and then she speaks with the woman in the parking lot who detects what she says was an odor of liquor on Miss Adams' breath. She then goes inside the brewery, and the woman says she watched Miss Adams through the window have like a one ounce shot glass taster of beer, and uh, then the police showed up. The woman phoned the police. Miss Adams gave a different version of events, didn't deny or comment on anything that happened in the parking lot, but said that after she parked her car, she went into the brewery, and inside she had two six ounce taster sized beers which she and her friends shared each having sips from them uh, followed by the police coming in and basically demanding that she provide a breath sample there was some you know issues about delaying the test because of mouth alcohol she blows she fails the test when it comes time for the review the police submit only a summary of what the witness report was there was a second report taken from the witness by a different officer after the police showed up and tested Miss Adams, and the police provided no details about what the second report had said. The judge, I thought quite rightly, concluded that the hearsay evidence was inadmissible in the review hearing because it didn't meet the threshold reliability test and imported into the IRP concept the two-stage analysis for the admission of hearsay evidence. I, I follow you. Yeah. Okay. So the lay out the test now for okay. us. I mean, <laughs> you deal with this all the time. I deal with it as well. But lay out the test for your listeners. So the the two stage test uh, involves first considering whether something is is admissible on a threshold basis. So whether it's sufficiently reliable to overcome the dangers arising from the difficulty of testing it, due to the absence of cross examination, the lack of contemporaneous notes, etc. Um, and in order to determine threshold reliability, trial judges are supposed to look at things like difficulties with um, the declarant's memory, perception, narration, or sincerity, and determine whether there are any sufficiently procedurally fair means of overcoming them. And if there are sufficient procedural guarantees of reliability, then the threshold test will be met. Did that make sense? I know the test. Well, so I know you know the test, but I mean, did it make sense like for to someone the, listening to, to the podcast? That... Well, I was listening to part of it. Okay. It made sense enough to tune me. Tune me out. I get it. No, I didn't tune you out. <laughs> I didn't tune you out. It's hot in here. Sure. Um, so that was what happened. And the court determined that because the second statement from this witness had not been provided, that alone was fatal to the admissibility of the hearsay evidence because it denied Miss Adams and the adjudicator the opportunity to assess whether there were any difficulties in the two statements, such as inconsistencies that would suggest they were unreliable. And that makes perfect sense. Doesn't to me. it though? Yeah. But did not make perfect sense to the Court of Appeal. So what did they really? Yeah. Oh. Yep. Okay. All right. Tell me, so, where did it go? What happened? So the IRP adjudicator's decision was reinstated. And oh really? Yes. Oh. Um the Court of Appeal said that Miss Adams was wrong. Uh, to have the hearsay evidence excluded because Section 215.5 of the Motor Vehicle Act, that's what they said the section was in their judgment, and I'm now remembering that that section's wrong because it's 215.49. But anyway, the Motor Vehicle Act says that an adjudicator must consider any of the information that's submitted to them and that the adjudicator may determine the weight to be given any piece of evidence. So but isn't, shouldn't the test instruct them about the weight to be given? No, the Court of Appeal said that that was express statutory intention to create their own admissibility rules. 
So basically anything's admissible subject to it being reliable, but not threshold reliable, just general reliable. See, I, I, I always felt that, that the threshold reliability test was um, something that I, I didn't think they were ever going to buy in the context of an IRP because they've already set the bar so low that I felt the threshold reliability test was something that was potentially could get turfed. Anyway, go ahead. So what they said was, if you could show that the hearsay evidence isn't reliable because it's situated in the context of a report that has other indicia of unreliability, and they, they referred back to a case from, ooh, like 2013, argued by my friend Faraz, um, called Jacobs. In that case, the police evidence had contradicted significantly uh, internally as well as with other accounts that were before the court or before the tribunal and ultimately the court. And the BC Supreme Court determined that the hearsay evidence couldn't be accepted as reliable because it was coming from a source that was apparently unreliable. And so you can't believe something that's coming, uh, it was double hearsay as well, that's coming from an unreliable source um, as being reliable itself. I got that well enough. Okay. So the Court of Appeal agreed with that and said that's how the adjudicators have to look at it. Is there other indicia of unreliability? But the problem for Miss Adams was that she had never contradicted any of the hearsay evidence by providing any other evidence other than what she drank inside the brewery. So she didn't give an affidavit with all the other evidence about what took place? About what happened in the parking lot? No, she didn't comment on it at all. Oh. So she basically just set out her drinking pattern, but left all of those other details uncontradicted. And the Court of Appeal had a problem with that. Well, I, 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 I'm, not enthousi- I'm not excited about the fact that they had a problem with it. I disagree with the fact that they had a problem with it. But the, you know, the reality is burden here, is. the burden is on the uh, applicant to establish it. So as a result of the, um, the legislative changes, the last, the last ones that came from Suzanne Anton. Yeah. Um, so what was interesting though, was the position taken by Miss Adams on the appeal. On the appeal, Miss Adams took the position that even if uh, the chamber's judge was wrong about the hearsay analysis, um, there were still problems with the adjudicator's decision because Miss Adams had said she consumed alcohol after she stopped driving. And how did they get past that? I don't see how you could get past that. They imported effectively into the post-driving consumption argument the new test in the criminal code. You gotta be joking. That because the burden was on her, they said she would have to show that her post-driving consumption would have had an effect on her blood alcohol level such that it explained her symptoms as alleged and uncontradicted by her and that it was consistent with a fail reading on the BASD. Wow, what were they thinking? I guess that That is appealable. That's appealable. Well, no, it's not because it's you have to make a leave application to the Supreme Court of Canada, and no, it's not going to get leave. You don't think so? No. Well, it's wrong. It's not national importance. Please, am I not the expert in what's going to get leave? I know. You <laughs> sought leave on things and succeeded and not. Yes, um, I also do host a weekly show called Cases That Should Have Gone to the Supreme Court of Canada But Didn't. Yes, okay. So and on that basis, make the cut. you don't think it would get on the show. No, it's an but administrative scheme. I blah, know, blah, blah. but it's, I mean, they're applying the, fe- the criminal code. They're applying federal legislation. Well, they didn't refer they're... to it, though. Ugh. They just, you know, danced around it. It was Ugh. like a beautiful little, like, Triceratops ballet. How can you say that that fail? You've just got a reading that says fail. How can you say that that fail is a result of alcohol consumed prior to driving? You've got, even if you've got an ounce or two, it, you could have been just below and it well, could, she could have, it just above. She could have set out her, and I think this full is drinking perhaps pattern? her full drinking pattern. She said nothing about whether she drank anything else during the day and the witness had smelled liquor on her breath. But they're doing exactly what they've the courts have given the tribunal difficulty with in the past, and that is assuming evidence that's uh, against her. Like, they're, 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 they're just... And, Paul, <laughs> you've hit the greatest irony of this judgment nail on the head. Because the other thing that Miss Adams argued, saying, you know, forget the hearsay thing. If you don't accept my position on the hearsay thing, then the adjudicator's decision was unreasonable. Because what the adjudicator had said 
actually I'll back up, what Miss Adams had done, at least, um, was she had an articled student from the firm where her lawyer worked to go to the brewery and take photographs of the windows to show that you couldn't see inside it from um, where this witness was supposedly standing and so the witness wasn't telling the truth. So that, that she should could be see the end she... of the reliability of that evidence. Let me finish. Couldn't see what she had consumed. Now, those w photographs were taken in the daytime, not at nighttime when the IRP took place, so that's probably not very helpful. Yeah, it's uh, but... daytime, nighttime lighting, what you can see through a window is completely different. Yes, but the adjudicator had inferred, um, saying that it's common sense, an ordinary human experience, that uh, it's easier to see into uh, a, a window, room. a lit room from outside in the dark yeah, because of, of the lighting. Because the lighting inside. The Court of Appeal found that that was a manifest flaw in the reasoning <laughs> that the adjudicator... So that was a flaw, but that then was they... A flaw. Well, the, even the BC Supreme Court judge said that that was flawed because you don't know, because it's going to depend on the quality of the lighting, the relative lighting outside. It's a parking lot of a business. No, and you've got the evidence that the windows are not easily seen through, it's a, which it's a seems business, to so it may contradict the... Markings or tinting or something on the sure, window. Sure, and it seems to contradict the evidence, the hearsay evidence. Yeah. So, but the Court of Appeal said that that was purely speculative. Oh my goodness. And so that was manifestly flawed about but the reasoning. But they, they went on to speculate about a drinking pattern what it, yeah. th that would be necessary in order to make it a fail. Yeah. Yeah. There you go. Ugh, pure. Ugh. And. Um, what are they thinking? Oh well, won't be appealed. That's the law. <laughs> yeah. The other thing though that Miss Adams argued, um, which was interesting to me, uh, very interesting comment by the Court of Appeal. She said it's procedurally unfair on her appeal that we don't get access to all of this information and that there's no burden on the police to submit all of it. And that's wrong because I should have the right to know all of the information so that I can respond to it and point out any inconsistencies. And if the police don't submit it, I'm screwed. And how do I meet my burden? But that's been our problem. That's been our problem. And the Court of Appeal said it is true that you don't have access to all of this information. And it may be the case that that is a procedural fairness violation given where the onus lies, but that wasn't argued at the hearing. So they threw a carrot. Yeah, I know, but I mean... I'm like catching sunk, it with they, a net. <laughs> they sunk a ship. Like they sunk a ship when I on... I mean, how many post-driving consumptions do we actually get? Well, that's the thing. There's so little. Why would they bother... Uh, Entering the realm of speculation and, and, it, just, and now it, compelling they're not somebody. They're not, I don't think that they, 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 I think you could argue that they didn't go so far as to say you'd have to prove that you, what you drank put you over 80 after, as long as you could show you weren't over 80 before. Well, I mean, you, you can still argue that now, and we argue that all the time, and there's it's touch and go. I mean, we usually only argue that when we have something else because we need to be able to pin it down um we're trying to succeed in immediate roadside prohibition hearing so that's not the not usually the end all argument but i suppose yes but i, I think the court is probably of the view that all you need to do is put in that evidence and that's never enough but remember this is a court of appeal that has a constitutional challenge on that very basis that's before true it. well we'll wait and see where that one goes yeah i mean you know you had good feedback when you argued it but it doesn't mean well, that i also had not good feedback when i argued that, it that exactly so now there was another point that counsel for miss adams argued that made the adjudicator's decision unreasonable and it was essentially because miss adams provided an affidavit that was completely consistent with her boyfriend and they basically said the same version of events that uh, his evidence must have been fabricated and was therefore unreliable. And the court said that that was also flawed because the similarity of the two affidavits could also support a positive inference that they were both telling the truth. And I've seen that before. We've seen yeah. that in decisions, your, especially your, early your on. Your witness is too similar. Yeah. Your witness is too dissimilar because you say you left at 4.01 and he says you left at 4.02. I know, and that's a problem that we have when we're writing affidavits for people because we ask them separately what they did and they'll tell us what they did and we're looking at it, okay, this is credible, we'll put it in your affidavit. And then you're sitting there looking at the affidavits before the hearing and you're thinking to yourself, 
they're so similar that they're going to reject it because they're they're looking at it and they're going to assume that this is somehow yeah. contrived when oh, the reality yeah. is it's just two people with good memories about what took place. The two of them are looking at their phones at the same time and they know the time. They're looking to the, their text messages as they walk out the door. They can figure it out because everybody's got a record of what they were doing because when they sent a text or took a call or whatever. Yeah, and also, like, I, I don't know, just every time it's so cynical. It's like if you have witness evidence and it's mildly inconsistent on some immaterial point, they're going to reject your credibility. If you don't have witness evidence, they're going to reject your credibility. If you have witness evidence and it's too similar, they're going to reject your credibility. There's literally no s version of events that you can provide to corroborate yours that will not run the risk of being used against you. The other car is described as gray, and then it's described as silver. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, you say your car's gray, and he says it's silver. Meanwhile, the police report says, like, green. Yeah. But, well, no. but never mind. No, the police report will usually say, like, light gray. <laughs> yeah. Silver gray. Um, so the Court of Appeal says um, that that's obviously unreasonable, but they say that none of that mattered. It didn't matter that the adjudicator engaged in pure speculation. It didn't matter that the adjudicator called the witness evidence fabricated because it was the same. Because Miss Adams did not tender any evidence to establish that her drinking at the brewery impacted the reported symptoms of her alcohol consumption and her ASD fail reading. And the adjudicator's decision was essentially on the undisputed evidence of her driving behavior, the witnesses' observations of her before she entered the brewery, her admitted alcohol consumption prior to driving, and the symptoms of her alcohol consumption observed by the police officers after she left the brewery. Um, so no, like... Well, that's interesting because the affidavits that we write for our clients would have headed off that argument. Well, yes, because we, we, care, we do cover that. off the symptoms. We cover off the consumption. You shouldn't have to, but we do it. We shouldn't have to, but we do We know that we, we basically feel that we have to try and prove our case beyond a reasonable doubt. Yeah. And the court says, ultimately, uh, even assuming a flawed reasoning process in the adjudicator's analysis, that error could not impugn the adjudicator's decision. Uh, the statutory scheme has been amended since the earlier decisions in which the reasonableness of an adjudicator's reasons has been discussed. The applicant now has the burden of demonstrating that the ASD fail reading indicating a BAC of over 80 milligrams per cent at the time of driving was inaccurate or unreliable. This requires an applicant to establish an evidentiary link between the applicant's post-driving alcohol consumption and its effect on the reliability of the ASD fail reading. We're not even talking about the time of driving. No. We're talking about... A person who, like, there's clear evidence was drinking after driving. Yep. Oh, Court of Appeal, what are you doing? Yeah, well, oh, I'm well. hoping that, like, you know, at least the uh, tribunal will accept that, you know, tiny little glimmer of hope that gleams through the cracks here. Well, it's funny because you always find something, even in the decisions that where they don't succeed, you always seem to find something that you use. I, half mm -hmm. the time when I'm listening to you make submissions in IRP hearings, I'm hearing you Refer to referring cases to I lost. cases that were or somebody else lost where mm -hmm. you've, you know, found the gold, the golden nugget in there, yeah. uh, at, which can turn it around in your case. So well, it's, that's it's always a... my plan. My plan is always to set up an argument where even if I lose, I'll at least get something that I can use in other cases. Well, lots of times that's not even part of the plan. The plan is to succeed and then no, you still... No, don't insult my chess still, game here. Is still, you still get something out of it in the end that can be used somewhere later on in another context. All right. I know, I know there's a chess game for you, but it's not like sometimes they're unexpected comments it, from the courts that have been very useful for it, you. It actually kind of feels like that chess game in The Seventh Seal. Have you ever seen that? The, the Bergman film? Yeah. I haven't. I have seen it, but it was close to 30 years ago. Yeah, like a man plays, death is coming for him, and he persuades death that they can just play a game of chess. And if death wins, then then he gets to die. And uh, if he wins, he gets to live. The, No matter what he does in the chess game, he can't win. Of course. Yeah, because you can't cheat death. Exactly. Yeah. Anyway, it just kind of reminds me of that some days. Take your time to move. This, this is a, this, this case is another, you know, it's just another move in the chess game against death. Yeah. Um, wow. Okay. But. It's always so positive. I Uplifting know. on this. 
podcast. We have about five to seven minutes left. Let's finish off on a high-ish note or a were they high note? Because I want to talk to you about our ridiculous driver of the week. Okay, tell me about it. This is a woman uh, whose driving actually occurred quite some time ago, but she was only recently uh, reported in the media, who was driving a uh, Land Rover around Merritt. Oh, this one. <laughs> this one. It got pulled over for excessive speeding, which on its own is not ridiculous enough. I'm surprised that we didn't hear this through from police officers right. and people talking about it. And Yeah, did you hear about the lady? So... <laughs> So she gets pulled over for excessive speeding. And I guess when the police told her that her precious Land Rover was going to be impounded, impounded. she took off. Just drove away. Drove away at really high speeds. So she's been detained yeah. as they are issuing her the ticket and towing the car. And it's a... Uh, well, actually, lawful. you're not detained. She's not detained at this point, but the car but is the car being is. detained. And it's, uh, you know, there is a justice issue happening here. Mm-hmm. So, um, yeah, she, oh my she goodness. drove away. She ended up making it back to the lower mainland and several weeks later was arrested for obstruction. I'm surprised they didn't driving. have a roadblock set up on the, uh, on the Coquihalla somewhere. That does surprise me. They probably considered the, but they had identified the her. They identified, and they'd identified her. her. Yeah. So they knew they were going to get her eventually. Just wait. You'll find her. Mm -hmm. She's, where is she going? Home. Like... <laughs> Well, there's uh, only really one direction too when you're traveling in that direction of the Coquihalla. You can't go anywhere else. Bunch you're going to end up in the Lower Mainland. Bunch of police officers have told me that they they've received instructions to to not give people promises to appear or appearance notices in any complex case these days to deal with them, release them, and then later on when charges are approved, uh, you know, get them back to court one way or another. Yeah. And the purpose of that is to to defeat Jordan. To get rid of the uh, pre-charge delay. So, so she ends up um, getting arrested at her home and the matter's proceeding through court. But in the meantime, the police and government have filed a civil forfeiture application to try to the Range Rover. Land Rover, but yeah. Land Rover. Same thing. Land Rover, Plus Range money. Rover. Yeah. <laughs> Land Rover. Okay. Yeah, they're trying to seize a Land Rover as an instrument of unlawful activity. Because apparently she has like a pretty heinous driving record. Well, the problem with this one is now you've got a, you know, bad case making bad law. <laughs> so, mm -hmm. you know, uh, the the beginning of the slippery slope. I'm sitting here listening to it. I've read about the driving. Uh, as I was reading it, I was thinking to myself, well, you know, it's not it's not difficult to make the argument in this case, is it? Um, look at this circumstance. Look at this driving. Um, here is the, the, what could be the clearest of the clear cases where, you know, civil forfeiture might be. But is it though? L look, what's the point of civil well, it, forfeiture? It, it, the point of civil forfeiture laws is to either take away the profits of being a criminal from people. And that's people. certainly not applicable. That's not what here. And to protect the public from further criminal activity by taking away the instruments of unlawful activity. The but, you have another, which... but you have another way to do it, and that's prohibit her from driving. Exactly. So, and, okay. And taking away her car doesn't do anything. All it does is make her buy a new car. Well, I think taking away her car in the civil forfeiture context here is really just the sort of the extreme level of punishment. All they're trying to do is, is uh, general and specific deterrence. And if you want general deterrence, you've got it here. I mean, if they take away her car because of this, there's a, anybody else in that circumstance with their Land Rover is going to think twice before trying to peel away from the police if they know about it. I mean, it's, there is some general deterrence value. Yeah, but general deterrence is achieved by the criminal sentencing process. Is the heavy hammer of civil forfeiture really necessary when the criminal process hasn't yet completed? And the issue of general deterrence at this point may still be addressed? And if her vehicle is seized under the justification of general deterrence, then does general deterrence become a less important consideration on sentencing for the criminal offense? Well, maybe it does. Maybe it does become a less important consideration. Maybe that's some benefit that she will get in the criminal case if her car has been, if her... She her... ends up with a discharge when that kind of driving gets you a suspended sentence if you're lucky. Yeah, if she's lucky. I mean, 
it wouldn't surprise me if she got a week in jail for that. Oh yeah, I mean, um, if I were if I were Crown, I'd be asking for jail, and if I were me, I would be offering a discharge with the hopes of negotiating it out for a suspended sentence. I would not. Yeah, I would. I would. <laughs> I don't think I'd get there's the a, suspended. You sentence. probably would get the suspended sentence. I might get it too. I might come at it a different way, but the uh, actually it probably would end up being a high fine, um, which again is come down to the money. And the money is the car. And the car is the vessel that she was using. And the car has been the threat in her driving. And but she... you can buy a 20-year-old Corolla and take off from the police in that too. Well, you're not going to get as far as fast when the police come up behind you on the highway. I mean, no, she didn't, and you're not going to look as cool. She didn't drive through fields and mountain paths to get back home <laughs> in that Range Rover. <laughs> she, she drove on the highway. Um, either way, they could have got her. But um, the... Uh, I, 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 there's a Nissan ad. Mm-hmm. Anytime I'm in a hotel room, I watch TV because I don't have a TV at home. And there's a Nissan ad where there's some people get stopped in traffic and then they just drive off the road to somewhere camping that's immediately yeah. uh, off the road. And free legal advice, don't do that. Yeah, well, exactly. Um, and uh, But really, you know, she's got the Range Rover. She's in <laughs> merit. She can just drive <laughs> off the road and... Anyway, what a dang fool. She is yeah. the ridiculous driver of the week. Ridiculous There's no doubt about that. Um, I um, I would rather see her dealt with in the uh, criminal context because I like the reasonable doubt standard and I don't like the standard that's used for civil forfeiture. I also don't want to see it being the slippery slope of anybody who is got an excessive speed uh, and maybe a lousy driving record or a couple of bad things on their uh, record than facing uh, civil forfeiture of their cars. But I'll tell you... I think there's a lot of people in British Columbia who would look every time we see a Ferrari or something like that pulled over at, you know, going 220 on the Lionsgate, everybody thinks the vehicle should be seized. So this will be something we debate in the future. Yes, and we'll see what happens with the civil forfeiture case and update you on a future episode of the Driving Law Podcast. Tune in next week for another exciting episode. And if you need to reach us, call us at 604-685-8889 or find us online at vancouvercriminallaw.com. And remember to check out bcdrivinglawyers.com for the Traffic Court Duty Council schedule. (laughs) 